welcome, everybody. I'd like to start by saying thank you for being here today. My name is Kate Fisher, and I'm really excited to be here to introduce today's speaker. First of all, I hope you're enjoying this city. I think it's great. I'm completely biased because I live here, but I am excited to have my friend Janice with us here today. She's going to be talking to you about um, ceramic objects and how they can offer a, a record of our tactile human experience and history. It's my pleasure to introduce Janice as I've enjoyed becoming better acquainted with both her and her work through my research that I did as a mother artist um, and I was working towards founding a website in 2014. I was amazed by her calm, steadfast commitment to her family and to sculpture as portrayed in the 20, 2008 documentary, Who Does She Think She Is? Janice was the February 2019, February um, 19 Artist of the Month on the Both Artist and Mother website, which is a dialogue-based community dedicated to exploring and supporting women who are both. An internationally recognized and collected ceramic artist and educator, Janice has been the recipient of several awards and grants, including multiple fellowships from the Ohio Arts Council. Currently, she is an assistant professor at Monmouth College in Monmouth, in Illinois. Please join me in putting your hands together and welcoming Janice. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you for being here today. And I want to thank Nsika for this opportunity to speak with you. Um, I love ceramics, and I keep finding more and more reasons to love ceramics. And fairly recently, I've gotten into ancient ceramics and find that there's all the more reason to love ceramics. So I want to share a little bit of that with you today, of the excitement that I've found as I've done some ceramic research. Um, Kate mentioned that I was in the documentary film, Who Does She Think She Is? And I continue to ask that question, and I open that up to a broader audience of who do we think we are as, um, as a human civilization? And it's interesting that we can follow that, or we can possibly answer that question through ancient ceramic artifacts. What I'm showing you here is not actually ancient artifacts. That's a sculpture of mine um, that I created. Um, I did that just for fun and to calm my nerves. Um, this is a little temporary tattoo that I have up here that I wanna give you all before you leave today, so don't leave without your free temporary tattoos because um, I love to show off the fact that we as a human civilization have been addicted to ceramics since around 29,000 BCE. So that's a pretty old and crazy addiction. So yay for us and yay for ceramics. A few years ago, I read the book called How We Got to Now by Stephen Johnston, and I loved his, um, this intriguing weaving that he did with the, ceram or with the material of glass and how he told the story of innovation through glass. But the entire time that I was reading it, I was thinking about ceramics, and I thought, you know, he only has half the story because glass is cool, but ceramics is cooler. <laughs> and I kept thinking about all the things he was missing by not talking about clay instead of glass. And so I wanted, I kept, and, um, in, in sort of honoring this thought, I couldn't stop thinking about, well, what would this story look like if we told it through the lens of ceramics? I also recently read uh, Neil McGregor's History of the World in 100 Objects, and I acknowledge that I use many of his objects today in my discussion, and I'm grateful for the research that he's done. Um, and again, I would like to point out that in both cases, they they do um, suggest that ceramics has an important role in, our, um, in our, the development of, um, of our humanity. All right, so oh, I just showed you the purpose of this lecture here. Um, it's to follow the path of human ingenuity and innovation as recorded in ancient ceramic art objects and to discuss new discoveries and insights made available through contemporary scientific instrumentation and interdisciplinary analysis being employed in the study of ancient ceramic artifacts. What I'm presenting is the idea that every ceramic object has a vast story to tell, not only in form and function, like we're used to talking about, but also contained within the material itself. And unless you're a little bit of a science geek, you may not know some of these awesome um, things that we're discovering in the, on the molecular level of ceramics. So, and I won't 
get totally geeked out today with details, but I want to introduce you to this idea of all of the things that can be contained within these artifacts. Ancient ceramic artifacts provide a tactile record of human history, capturing the very fingerprints of early ingenuity and innovation. In fact, ceramic objects often represent the most numerous artifacts collected during architectural excavations, as illustrated here in this slide uh, um, in Malaga, Spain. Um, you can see the plenitude of ceramic artifacts that are left over here. They, in fact, they are the main chronocultural chrono indicators of a specific period of time. To archaeologists, the existence or absence of ceramics is one of the most fundamental indica indicators of a society's stage of development. An aceramic society um, has few ways of storing food or water and lacks the ability to visualize social or spiritual complexities. Thus, it remains limited until ceramic technology emerges. Historical timelines are often categorized as pottery or pre-pottery period, and they quite literally demonstrate the significance of, that ceramics has in civilization and in studying civilizations. So why are there so many clay leftovers? When clay is exposed to a high temperature, its chemistry and structure changes, rendering it impervious to liquid and causing it to permanently retain its shape over a range of conditions. This gives longevity to ceramic artifacts. And we have quartz inversion to thank for this. And this is what I tell my students so that to help them remember exactly what quartz inversion is, this idea that quartz inversion sort of rocks you a little bit and it literally turns, to ro uh, turns clay to rock. All right, it can be achieved around 570 degrees Celsius when a, a change in quartz happens from the alpha to the beta state. This molecular restructuring results in material permanence. And that's thus the whole rocked out thing. Um, but I'd like to note that this um, inversion, this fired clay and bisquare, does not spontaneously occur in nature. It is an early human engineered substance, um, and it is a human engineered process. So there we go for our human ingenuity, right? As a starting point today, I'm going to begin with the earliest indication of exposing ceramic material to quartz inversion temperatures. Um, I, I do find it humorous and ironic that the area predating kiln-fired ceramics is often re referred to as the software horizon, because software today means something really different for us. Um, we think of like high tech, but um, in actual fact, uh, it was considered low tech because it's like pre-fired ceramics, so it's kind of fun. The forms, textures, and patterns of ancient ceramic artifacts clearly illustrate creativity and abstract thought processes. And there's already wonderful discussion about this topic and whether objects are practical or prestige. There's a lot of research in this field. But today I'm hi highlighting archaeometry, which is a multidisciplinary research method using non-destructive means to investigate ceramic materials and production practices on a micro level to gain a deeper understanding of ancient cultures, provenance, and ancient environments. So here's an image of um, the scanning electron microscope at the Library of Congress and currently employed in the study of ancient objects. So today I've chosen a selection of objects which have literally captured the fingerprint of early human ingenuity to guide us through our discussion and how modern technology is revealing exciting new discoveries contained within clay. This is by no means the whole story, um, but it's meant to be the start of a broad conversation. And because we only have an hour, I'm choosing just a, you know, a, a broad array, but um, hopefully this will get you started in thought. Object number one, it's hard not to start with the Venus of Estonis. This was found in Moravia in what is now the Czech Republic. It dates back to 29,000 to 25,000 BCE, uh, which is before Common Era, and is currently the oldest known fired ceramic object. It was discovered in 1925 in a Paleolithic settlement site among hundreds of clay figurines in close proximity to the remains of a horseshoe-shaped kiln. The distinctively female form of Venus of Astonis implies robust cultural focus on fertility, and experts continue to debate about the likely purpose. Um, but what we do know about it um, is that it was fired to a low maturity range of 500 to 800 
degrees Celsius, demonstrating an early understanding of temperature manipulation in a kiln. Cracks on the statue and similar objects found at the site imply a pyro-ritualistic experimentation and interest in thermal shock, suggesting intentional exploding of the figurines may have been the prime function of these ceramics rather than being manufactured as permanent portable objects. Curators at the Moravian Museum, where this Venus um, object resides, have conducted extensive archaeometric research on this artifact. Through the use of a Raman mass spectrometer, which um, provides a structural fingerprint by which molecules can be identified, and it relies on a Raman scattering or a monochromatic light, usually from a laser, um, in near ultraviolet range. The Venus's clay body revealed that uh, traces of mammoth ivory and sediment were contained within the clay body, and this helped in recreating the environmental makeup of the prehistoric Gravettian landscape. Using computerized tomography or computer-assisted imaging um, by sections or sectioning through the use of any kind of penetrating wave, that's what the CT is, um, a scan was taken of the Venus of Estonis. And here we go, here are some um, images from that. Um, through the scan, there was detected a distinctive three by five millimeter fingerprint of a youth that was applied before firing. By the way, specialists in paleodermatoglyphics, which is the study of ancient human fingerprints, recognize ceramic materials as being the most prevalent transfer media for early fingerprint specimens. So another yay for ceramics. Experts believe that this little fingerprint that was found is too small to be the original maker's fingerprint, and so it indicates possibly prehistoric multitasking between parent and child, or a social or ritualistic collaboration between an older and a younger person. Either scenario, um, th this artifact records human creative interaction so all you parents out there who multitask while they make ceramics or do, do other things while you do ceramics, this goes way, way back in history. A recent 3D scan of the back and head studied the holes in the head of this, um, of this figurine, and they were found that they were likely made using a bird feather. You can see the holes there on this figure's head. Um, further research and 3D modeling, um, they hope to reveal more about the bird species that created the, or that this feather was a part of. While the scan certainly opened further questions, much has been gained by analyzing this extraordinary small ceramic artifact. Um, here's, an, here's an image of the 3D scan of the Venus of Astanis. And you can see they re resulted in eight gigabytes of data from just scanning this small object. I want to be clear that there are many cultures that have early ceramic figurines. And so I, we could talk about this um, from many angles. And in most cases, they have been analyzed by CT and Raman spectrometry. And are, there are wonderful, numerous um, research uh, documentation about all of these wonderful finds that they're having. Uh, we have we have research from the Nok culture, from the Indus Valley or Harappan, um, from the Cucutini and from the Tlatilco cultures in Mexico. All of these have been studied by studied um, by mass spectrometry. Um, yeah, these are more figures where they have done research. I wish I had time today to talk about all of them. You could talk just about figurines this entire time. But we have to move on because there's more important, th well, not more important things. There are other things like mud brick and adobe. This would be an image of the great ziggurat of Ur in Iraq, a Mesopotamian structure originally begun in the 21st century BCE, over 100 feet high, and it was rebuilt again in the 6th century BCE using clay. Clay either as fired or unfired brick or adobe is one of the oldest known building materials. The use of mud brick predates vessel or container making by several millennia, according to Prudence M. Rice, who wrote on the origins of pottery. Here's an image of Argibam, the largest adobe structure ever built. 
It seems to be human instinct to respond to adversity with problem solving, which leads to innovation. In this case, the warm Mesopotamian environment lacked stone and trees, but clay was readily available, and thus mud brick was problem solving at its finest. Not just in this Mesopotamian culture, but in other cultures as well. Here we have the Huaca del Sol in Peru, a brick temple built by the Moche civilization, 100 to 800 CE. Use of mud brick is globally extensive. There's evidence at Katal Hoyuk in Turkey, um, Peru, in Iran, in Iraq, many civilizations, many continents, and it's still in use today. This would be the great mosque of Dijen Mali, which if you've been in an art history class, we always talk about as being one of the most important adobe structures in the world today. In ancient Egypt, structures were predominantly adobe or mud brick. In fact, the word adobe comes from the ancient Egyptian word dup, dp, which means brick. Um, the pyramids, however, were cut stone, so the higher, um, higher architecture was made with stone, and the architecture for the people was made with mud brick. This is a painting on the tomb wall, and Thebes in it portrays Egyptian slaves mixing, tempering, and carrying clay for the sun-dried bricks. The Indus Valley Civilization, and we're talking about 28th through the 18th century BCE, employ the meticulous use of, measure, of measured bricks. Structures were constructed using bricks with a four to one ratio, which is still considered today to be the optimal standard for brick, make, brick making. Um, around 3500 BCE, there was a widespread implementation of fired brick because it was more durable and weather resistant. It was manufactured by forming clay, as we just saw in the Egyptian um, image, forming clay, mixing it with organic materials such as grass, straw, and sand for temper, and placing in molds, and then stacking and firing them in a clamp, which was an impromptu kiln. So what can mud bricks tell us through archaeometric arche examination? Uh, recent studies have used a mass, mass spectrometer to read ancient bricks, and they're finding that the sedimentary grain size composition and the phosphate concent um, concentration is detectable, and researchers are able to define the ancient um, depositional history, landform changes, and land usages of the sediment source area. Microanalysis of the mud brick also looks at imprints left from the chaff or the organic materials that were burned out, so the, the sort of uh, fingerprint that's left behind from these organic materials. And they can get valuable arch archaeobotanical data about ancient local vegetation that was used as temper. All right, the ancient pottery vessel. Some researchers think that cooking may extend back to more than one and a half million years. Controlled, controlling fire led to cooking, which led to fundamental changes in the early human diet. Ceramic vessel technology developed in many civilizations globally. There's ongoing debate about the origins of the earliest pottery vessels, who was first, um, as new finds continue to be located, and there seems to be an ongoing fight between like Japan, China, Japan, China. Um, and at the moment, Japan and China are the earliest, spreading to the Russia Far East and on to Europe, with pottery shard evidence dating back to 20,000 to 17,000 BCE. Early ceramics were sun-dried in or fired at low temperatures in rudimentary kilns dug in the ground. There's so much to say about the invention of the pottery vessel as both a prestige and a practical tool for containment and cooking and serving and fermentation and preservation. In 2012, um, fragments of 20,000-year-old pottery were, were found in the Zion Rendong Cave in um, Zhangyi Province, uh, southern China, and I apologize if I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> the cave had been inhabited by mobile foragers who hunter gathered in the last glacial maximum. Their concave vessels were likely used for cooking food and the site at, at the site in which the pottery fragments were found is one of the earliest kitchens. So this would be Jomon pottery here that you see. And this was as reported in the, this is an image that I'm sourcing from the New York Times. Some of the oldest known pottery is from uh, Japan's Jomon culture. Pottery, pottery fragments from very small rounded pots, like I said before, um, made by this hunter-gathering people. 
um, may, are dating around up to 18,000 years old. Classified by the amounts of, or the massive amounts of pottery evidence, and we're talking over 70 different styles of pottery. The Jomon people engaged in the craft in an almost industrial scale, suggesting that they were more than just simple hunter-gatherers. They created these smaller vessels due to the need for portability. As later bowls increase in size, this is taken to be a sign of an increasing settled pattern of living. These discoveries found in the fingerprint of the ceramic fragments are changing our fundamental theory that pottery was invented after the solid transition to agriculture that allowed settlement and the complex development of human civilization. That every vessel can, carries within it a chemical composition, a pattern, or a fingerprint identical with the clay from which it was made, this is fundamental to provenance studies. Archaeometric testing on pottery helps us to obtain data and uh, dating and source data, and also to track social and trade exchange. Tests must be carried out on pre-screened pre and uncontaminated samples. And to give you an idea of the complexity of the analysis that pottery undergoes, this is um, an image of some strata that's used. Uh, so these are some of the tools that are being used. An accelerator mass spectrometer is used for testing of, of organic materials such as carbon. Micromorphological and mineralogical studies of form and structure on the molecular level are carried out on the sediments and the cave formations. So you can see in the strata all the layers of sediment that are um, being studied. Romage, um, sorry, Raman imaging spe uh, microscope is used for precision measure measurement. Infrared spectra analyzed by Raman spectrometry also shows what temperature that pottery fragments were exposed to, to um, and it is based on the absence of absorption, absorption peaks. Taxonomic and tax, tax I'm getting, uh, taxonomic classification of, of fossilized fauna or organisms is carried out on the area surrounding where the pottery fragments were found. All of these resources are being employed to come up with um, information about dating and um, about the material. So you can see there's this wide range of interdisciplinary study that goes into this. And I want to show you just a couple of cool things that they're coming up with. In 2016, CAT scans were taken of a late Jomon period, which was around 4500 BCE vessel um, from Japan. Scans revealed about 500 adult maize weasel, weevils, which are destructive pests of stored rice and grains. And you can see all these little tiny dots that are on the screen um, indicate the little um, cavities where these weevils were located in the pot. Um, the weevils were fired in within the clay body. This discovery provides data on the cultivation and distribution of food and entomology in the Jomon era because these little um, cavities, we can sort of recreate the body of these little tiny creatures um, using ceramics. The fact that weevils inhabited an area with a cold winter is an indicator for the distribution of food products by humans and also an indicator that there was a warm indoor environment that persisted throughout the winter that could handle, or that, that weevils could live in. Um, organic residue analysis on lipids or um, fat residues left behind on containers that are contained in, on pottery fragments um, can offer clear pictures of what was cooked and stored in vessels anciently. In the case of Jomon samples that were studied, um, foragers, I'm, I'm sorry, the Jomon people who were foragers, uh, remains of boar, birds, tortoise, fish, deer, and small mammals, as well as rice, were found in residue, or residues on the surface of the ceramic material. Um, it's interesting because rice is not thought to have been domesticated until thousands of years later, so we're still doing research on whether or not we have domesticated rice at this point. A recent study in Japan of lipids from 143 different Jomon vessels provides clear evidence that pottery across the sequence was predominantly used for cooking marine and freshwater resources during the Holocene, during the Holocene period. 
We have an interesting uh, uh, Jomon vessel here. Um, it's in the collection of the British Museum. It's originating around 5000 BCE, and it was originally a cooking pot. Undulations clearly visible on the interior show a method of manufacture as being coiling and hand molding of low fire red pottery. And then the exterior decorated with cord markings and the name Jomon comes from, that means cord marked. Much later in the 18th century, it was repurposed as a fresh water jar for Edo period tea ceremony uh, with the addition of lacquered gold interior and a lacquered wood lid. And I love this piece because it weaves centuries of culture and tradition together with old and new culture or old and new tradition. There's a fascinating article written by Aline de Geyer titled Lessons from the Ancients, Engineered Ceramic Materials and Climate Change. And she uses um, Jomon pottery as an example of a, of a people who engineered their way out of climate trouble. And she suggests that we can look to ancient cultures such as the Jomon who were forced to react to severe climate change in the late Pleistine era when, most, uh, when there was the most recent ice age. So she asked this question, ancient cultures used innovative ceramic pots as part of their adaptation to severe climate change. What role might engineered ceramic materials have in addressing today's climate and pollution challenges? Today we distinguish between pottery as an art form and distinct from, uh, very distinctive from technical ceramics for engineered applications. However, in ancient times, like as in the case of the Jomon, pottery was the engineered innovation that met the needs of the contemporary people and was an art form. All right, the next thing I wanna talk about is of course the potter's wheel. One of the earliest known statues here of a potter from the, an Egyptian tomb in Giza, it shows a potter squatting before a low, Hand turned wheel as he forms a broad bowl. Appears to be using a turntable here with a heavy wheel head, probably made of stone. It had a central socket pivoting on a hard stone point. Its weight and the low friction bearing would produce force and speed and the needed RPMs. This innovative concept of a wheel was likely first employed not in transportation, but as a potter's wheel. This was a tool developed by multiple cultures, I wanna just put in there too, and not just um, Egypt and Mesopotamia, um, but it had an early application in the Mesopotamian civilization around 4000 or 3500 BCE. This predates the use um, it, as a, in a chariot wheel by approximately 300 years. So before we figured out it could turn our carts and we could use it for carts, we were using it for pottery. Interestingly, we also have wheels um, for transport though, recorded in early pottery. Um, this is a replica of the uh, Bronici, uh, Bern I can't even, <laughs> I'm so nervous I can't talk today. Uh, the Bronosis pot, discovered in Poland. It's a ceramic vase incised with the earliest known image of what may be a wheeled vehicle. And it was dated um, by radiocarbon method to be around 3370 BCE and is attribu attributed to the funnel beaker archeological culture. So we even have record of that on pots. All right, um, recent studies can show us all sorts of things about how pots were created. These are um, images courtesy of the Radiological Society of North America showing off that their CAT scans can do a lot more than just detect cancer. Um, they can also tell us really cool things about how pottery was made. In this case, we have an Arbolos, um, a Greek vessel, and you can see through a CAT scan how it was created and the thinness of the walls. You can also see that there's a little air bubble there, and it indicates uh, the, that the inner body uh, maybe wasn't handled as well as it could have been by a potter. Um, we can see evidence of it, um, of the way it was turned by hand. Here's another one here, a Lekithos, um, and we can see the pottery on the outside, and then we can see the CAT scan. Um, showing um, attenuation, a finding that indicates, or a, I'm sorry, homogeneous attenuation, a, a finding that indicates good handling of the clay. This flask has a thick bottom with a V shape in it, and you can see how thick that is down there and how thin the walls are. 
Of course, we'd have no indication of that if we couldn't see an x-ray of it, so it's really cool to see what it looks like x-rayed. Um, you can see where a restorative process was performed in modern times on the bottom base of it and how the base was assembled um, as a separate piece. This is my favorite vessel. This is called the Miracle Jar, and it dates to around 325 BCE in Etruria. And the reason I like this one so much is it was likely a breast reliever, which is fantastic. It was decorated uh, with red figure technique. Um, but the CAT, scan sh the CAT scan shows that there are no air bubbles in this, indicating good handling of the clay. And you can see the beautiful form on the inside. We would not have any idea of, of that inner wall unless we had a CAT scan of it. So this jar is double walled with the system of channels in the handles and on the, to the outside. And this would um, relieve a nursing mother from her excess milk by inserting her sore breast. It's awesome. Of course, we have the invention of cuneiform writing, which is recorded heavily in clay. We have over 30,000 or more um, uh, cuneiform tablets. Uh, this would be a one from the British Museum's collection. Writing was another critical development in Mesopotamian culture that was recorded primarily on ceramic tablets. The material, which was wet clay, was very easy to source. You could grab it from the ground, you could make marks in it, and you could easily make corrections. These tablets not only reveal the evolution of cuneiform, a tradition which endured 3,000 years, but continued analysis of these ceramic tablets provides insight into mathematical, astronomical, and cultural advances. This would be the flood tablet. It's baked clay, and it is um, this particular part shares the epic of Gilgamesh, or the flood story. As part of his conquest, Ashurbanipal, the final king of Nineveh, scoured the known world for cuneiform tablets to create a colossal library. Some of the tablets stored in his library were already thousands of year old, years old at the time that he collected them. And, um, he, and these collections included uh, detailed military tactics, myths, prophecies, and technologies. This library was the first of its kind in the world. In the 6th century BC, it was devastated by fire. But interestingly, rather than it destroying, the ta destroying this library, since they were clay tablets, the inferno exposed them to quartz inversion, and, um, and because of this, it made them harder and stronger. So they were rediscovered in the 19th century, and there were over 34 tablets unearthed and sent to universities and museums spread across the world. Much of our understanding of the pre-classical world, um, from Sumerian flood myths to the oldest known book, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh, have come to us through this amazing collection that has been fired, courtesy of this library fire. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh tells of the futility of the human quest of immortality. His famous words, Gilgamesh's famous words were, should I fall, I will have established my fame, and certainly his fame lives on through these ceramic tablets. This is my, fa um, this, um, my favorite use of technology, by the way, um, is that uh, the, the in Islamic State um, has worked very hard in the systematic destruction of the Assyrian history. And the British Museum and other um, partners, the University of Mosul being one of them, has, has made it their mission to digitize and rebuild the entire library of Ashur Nepal, uh, which will reunite them on a vast central website to be preserved for future generations, over 30,000 tablets. So I love that they're, that they're able to do this with digital technology. This would be the Cyrus Cylinder, and I don't have a lot of time to go into um, how awesome this artifact is, but it is clay, and it is an account of the Persian king Cyrus the Great after his conquest of Babylon in 539 BCE. He recorded the restoration of statues to the various temples that had been removed by the previous king. He gave his subjects religious freedom, and he allowed exiled groups to return to their homelands. This clay object is considered by some to be the world's first written human rights charter, inscribed 2,600 years ago in the Persian Empire in clay. Many museums use um, computed tomography 
to read these cuneiform um, tablets, in particularly beca because they are uh, many times encased in an outer clay envelope um, that has been fired or is permanent. In the olden days, they would take these envelopes and break them to get to the inner cuneiform tablet. Now, because we have this ability to read what's inside, uh, we no longer need to break the outside so we can keep it intact. Many museums use this. This would be one here um, using a scanner, and this is at the Cincinnati Museum of Art, and they're using CT scanning um, to be able to see inside the, one of these hidden clay or these clay envelopes, and they're able to tell uh, to see very clearly the writing that's inside. All right. Next, I want to talk about the awesomeness of ceramic glazes and pigments. Naturally occurring pigments, I tell my art history students, are contained in awesome prehistoric cave art. We have ochres um, and iron oxides that were used as colorants since prehistoric times. We have evidence that early humans used paint and these pigments for aesthetic purposes, such as body decoration and cave painting. And we have some that date all the way back, unbelievably. Uh, we have a, it, an instance um, near uh, a, Lusaka, Zambia, where we have a 350,000 to 400,000 years year old pigment samples, if you can even believe that. Um, it is thought that ancient, uh, so we have the use of pigments being employed since the very early beginnings of humanity. It's thought that ancient glass manufacture is closely related to pottery making, which flourished in Upper Egypt as early as 8,000 BC. While firing pottery, the presence of calcium oxide containing sand combined with soda and the overheating of the, in the pottery kiln may have resulted in the first colored glazes on a ceramic pot. Experts believe that it was not until 1500, uh, 1500 BCE that glass was actually produced independently of ceramics and fashioned into separate items. This would be a, um, Egyptian faience, which has been um, studied exclusively. And this is just, uh, I just pulled up one example of some of the research being done to show the microstructure of faience. Um, this is not to be confused with Italian faience, which has also been studied, but that's another century. Um, this is Egyptian faience, which was likely created to simulate semi-precious blue stones like turquoise or lapis lazuli, and consisted of a silica-heavy base which likely came from fine desert sand or quartz rock and contained lesser amounts of alkaline salts like natron and plantage, lime and a metallic colorant, off, um, usually copper, which was commonly found material in the Egyptian environment. During the firing process, the alkali acting as a flux and the lime acting as a stabilizer reacted with the silica in the core to form the glaze on the surface. Uh, observed in cross-section, the microstructure of faience reveals at least two different layers of material, an inner core and an outer layer of glaze. Because of time, I can't get into all the cool things that we can learn from faience and also from the methods of creation, but you can clearly see this um, when you do keep the scans. You can see all these different um, nuances of the material. Some scholars have proposed that the raw materials for faience were obtained as a byproduct of hard, hard stone drilling, which occurred in Egypt, as copper tools were used with abrasive sand to drill or saw granite or hard limestone. The waste powders from this process consisted of quartz and lime from the limestone and also contained particles of copper from the drill. So potentially, the stuff on the ground created a ready-made source of material to make faience. So this is one um, possibility of how faience came to be. It must be fired in a kiln to create the brilliant color on the surface. During firing, the alkaline components, um, the salty crust formed with the effervescence method, uh, react with the ground quartz and copper oxide and lime to form a glaze on the surface. This would be a really famous example of an adorable hippo um, that is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. And it just so happens this, that this little guy undergoes quite a bit of scanning and research because of its uh, availability there at the Met. Um, it's so through scanning this, and I'll show you sort of the process here, um, there are many objects which have been scanned, um, but one of the things that 
we're able to tell is where it's been restored in ancient and modern times. And you can also um, tell evidence of how it was um, held up in the kiln because uh, faience being a, a flexy material, it needs some sort of a kiln furniture to be able to hold it up. And so to the naked eye, you would not be able to, to discern how it might have been held up by kiln furniture. But using um, CAT scanning, we're able to determine exactly how it might have been stacked in the kiln. So this little hippopotamus here, you can see it on its um, positioned under the x-ray tube. And, oh, I thought I had more. I guess I only, I pulled out the other images of it. Um, but anyway, it's, they were able to, to determine how it was stacked in a kiln based on the little tiny um, uh, textures that were on its underbelly. The hippopotamus in the picture was a Middle Kingdom Egyptian faience. Uh, and again, using x-ray fluorescence, and using a stereo microscope, it was able to see um, areas on the underbelly that had almost no glaze, and the, they were able to figure out where exactly the kiln furniture made contact with the actual object so that they could recreate what early kiln furniture might look like. Here you are looking at um, the soldier, mosaic soldiers from Persepolis. Iranian excavations show evidence of the first glazed tiles dating from around 1500 BCE, um, used for architectural facades of the palaces and tombs of the Archimedean Persian Empire, um, and richly decorated with color. We can tell by um, archaeometric research that this color was composed of a high silica material, similar to faience, um, decorated with alkaline glazes, and showing the artisans um, in that period were able to work with multiple mediums to recreate a polychromatic finish. In fact, they found um, evidence of earthen plaster tempered with gravel and earthen plaster tempered with organic materials and colored earths and pigmented, pigmented paints and lime plasters all contained within the materials um, in these tiles. Mosaics were a prestige technology during the Roman Byzantine period, meaning that this showed off your wealth and power if you had Roman mosaics. Um, we have uh, the technology of cement or grout to thank also for mosaic technology, but again, employing ceramics. This is an example of a 17-year-old, a 17-year-old, a 1700-year-old mosaic floor from the villa of a wealthy merchant in Lod, Israel. It was recently discovered while preparing land to build another a museum for another earlier found mosaic. So there's mosaics in plentitude being found um, in contemporary culture in Israel. Tile working blossomed in the Iranian Islamic period and became the most important decorative feature of religious buildings during the Byzantine era. This would be an example of um, architectural ceramics. This would be the Dome of the Rock begun in 687 CE and built by the Caliph Abdel Malik. Um, note the use of cobalt in Islamic tile. This was a later influence to the Chinese who brushed it on their beautiful white porcelain, but it was imported from Israel, courtesy of the Silk Road. And here we see a close-up of some of the Kufic inscription among the brick patterns. You can see this beautiful Islamic tile. Of course, this also being a collection of ancient writing that's um, kept because of the permanence of the ceramic material. It's in good use today and still um, a very beautiful building to see. All right, here we have the image of Apulu, or the Apollo from, of Ve. Um, this is from the roof of a temple near Ve, Italy. Now, we do not currently have the temple. The temple is gone, but hey, the ceramics is still here from the temple. So that will tell you how extra permanent the ceramic material is. This is painted terracotta, um, this large scale. It is 5 foot 11, so it is larger than, or around life size, and it dates from around 500 BCE. This is a prime example of a Trustan sculpture used, um, during the archaic period. And it's, um, 
It's important because it's a completely Etruscan innovation to use sculpture in this way, architecturally placed at the peak of the roof of a temple, creating what must have been an impressive tableau against the backdrop of the sky. Um, so this technical knowledge required to create large-scale terracotta sculpture was prevalent in this Roman society and is even named by Pliny, who was a Roman writer, um, that quite possibly the master sculptor Volca made this, um, this ancient artifact out of terracotta. Other things such as masks, antifixes, and decorative details were made of ceramic materials on these ancient buildings. Another awesome example um, of the Etruscan, from the Etruscan society, this is of a sarcophagus, a reclining couple. This is also a large-scale terracotta piece. Um, originally, it was, found, it, it was found in 1881 in over 400 pieces, so it had to be pieced together. But it was originally built um, all in one piece and then cut in half, and you can still see the seam in the middle of the piece. Um, so that it could, it would have um, damages prevented during firing. So uh, this was a way to mass or to produce these massive, uh, massively sized sculptures. And this was a sarcophagus, and it um, was it also employed the use of mold making. The two figures, the both the male and female, have very similar facial features. Were likely created from the same mold, indicating a use of mold making, which is another. Um, a, technology employed in multiple civilizations um, around the same time. A really, a really awesome thing that happened with this piece is that they used a 3D tech to uh, 3D digitize or texture map this sarcophagus. And in 2013, they had this really amazing exhibition in Italy where they were able to take this sarcophagus and three-dimensionally break it back into the 400 fragments that it, that it was found in. And you can actually go online and see this exploding into the 400 original fragments it was found in. And of course, it's done as an ex as a three-dimensional or, or a virtual explosion, but it gives you an idea of what it's been through, its history and being exploded and then put back together. But I love that um, they employed that, the use of um, modeling technology in the um, museum exhibition. We have so many, many um, Greek and Roman vessels which tell the story of the civilization and of the culture. And of course, we don't have time to go into the many awesome innovations, but here's just an example of one. Here we have um, a bronze foundry detailed um, in great detail um, by an Achylix cup that was found in Volci, Italy around 490 BCE. And you can see this decoration clearly shows the tools and it shows the kilns and, um, the, um, and how exactly they went about in their bronze foundry. I love the fact that none of them are wearing clothes though. They've got their hats on though, but no clothes. Why would you need clothes when you're exposed to a furnace, right? Um, but I love that image. Uh, we also have images that collect, uh, you can see the use of the wheel on a chariot here employed. So again, ceramics recording the, inno the local innovations and um, chariots. We also have ceramics providing us with quite a lot of in, um, information about war technology and war innovation. This is a detail from a, um, a, a hope light. Uh, let, me t let me see here, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the uh, Macmillan painter is um, associated with this. And this is a view of hope light warriors being played into battle. And this is called the Chiggy Vase from uh, Greece. Um, this, is, this represents a, um, this sort of visually represents a huge shift in the technology of war. Before the age of the Hopelite warrior, which was a citizen soldier, before this time, um, fighting was an aristocratic affair. Very few people had money to afford heavy armor and swords and horses and chariots that dominated the wars in the late Bronze Age. Um, but having, but at some point, someone figured out that having a larger number of well-equipped men, particularly if they were organ in an organized fashion, would bring more success on the battlefield. Greek historian uh, Victor Hansen has even speculated that the hoplite warfare may have played an important role in the development of democratic systems in go the government in Greece. 
So here we have, and here's another example of the Hope Light. Oh, I'm sorry, I went back the wrong way. Here we go. Um, showing lightweight weapons, um, we have a, a long ash wood spear and a short sword. We have a, a bronze helmet, a, bless, a breastplate of bronze and leather. Um, the Hope Light soldiers carried a large circular shield. Um, they were accompanied to battle with music, and you, we saw that illustrated on the pot. So all of these cool illustrations um, show, uh, and they show us the technology of war that was created during this time and was still um, in, in use in our uh, modern times. There's this deeply seated warrior ethos within the Greek society, and we see this in many other cultures, not just the Greek and Roman civilization. And here we have an example of the moche, a moche warrior pot, also from the collection of the British Museum. We have these themes of death, burial, and these mass-produced items um, using mold technology. So a lot of parallels between the Roman technology and Roman civilization and um, the and the Mochi civilization on another continent. The Mochi portrait vessels were so realistic that individuals portrayed at different stages of their lives were identifiable. The, um, pro they were made creating uh, two press molds put together, and um, there's a lot to be said about the technologies of the Moches too. In fact, tens of thousands of Mochi ceramics have survived today. And a 29,000 square foot ceramics workshop was unearthed um, in the mountain region of Mayal in the Chekama Valley. So we have um, an amazing uh, Moche heritage. This, of course, being one that we all know so well, the Terracotta Army. Um, this would be another example of mold making and complex mass production methods being employed and recorded in ceramics. This terracotta, war, um, this terracotta army was uncovered in 1974 in Xi'an, China. Thousands of carefully sculpted warrior figures and artifacts provide evidence of sophisticated mass production and assembly methods of standardized objects through mold making. There have been extensive research studies done on these, and there continue to be. The Chinese are awesome at um, using new technology to study these. One of the new, uh, the most recent analysis was done on the pigments, and they found the use of Chinese purple, which they thought um, originally was not used, um, uh, but it has expanded their knowledge of this pigment. Other things they have found are the binding media that was used in order to paint these, and that it was found that egg and animal were used to bind, or egg and animal glue were used to bind the pigment to the clay. Something else that blew my mind when I found out about it is that there is new research indicating that the that the Greeks had a, a possible hand in helping the Chinese to. Um, create this Chinese terracotta army, and they are using 3D scanners um, with the bones, the human remains that are left it, at this site, and they are now using these scanners to capture the texture and the bones of um, these human remains, and they're in hopes of doing facial reconstruction to identify the ancient workforce that created these um, vessel or th that created these this army. So that is something exciting that's happening now. Last year at Enseca, there was an excellent um, discussion about uh, Mayan molds and also the ancient Mayan civilization, really good at using molds. Um, here we have an image of a Roman lamp, which is another example of a mass-produced uh, mass item. Um, there is a lot to be said about lamps, lamp technology itself and being able to harness or capture, safely capture fire to be able to use, to, for use uh, for lighting purposes and to be able to control the flame through use of a wick. But the interesting thing about these Roman lamps is that they were also commercial prod products. So this one was stamped, um, again, using a two-part mold. Sometimes they were thrown on the wheel um, but in many cases, they were mass produced. And this lamp shows a gladiator. Um, it was found near the Colosseum in Rome, and it was likely sold as a trinket or a memento for those who were going to the games. And of course, it doubled as a useful lamp. 
One of the wonderful things that we're finding from, um, from LAMPS is that we're able to study the organic lipids that are, again, found on, as, as residue on the surface of ceramics, and we're able to detect um, the provenance of the oil and all sorts of things about oil, oil and they're finding that the uses of olive oil and the, the olive oil itself pre is, is going back earlier and earlier in its dates. Um, even seemingly clean vessels often contain remains of food um, or lipids, and um, so ceramic, the ceramic material itself, it, it creates a really good fabric to protect um, these organic substances from decay so that they can be studied. This is another example of a mass-produced item. This is a Korean roof tile, and again, um, ancient 8th, 8th century CE. Um, my time is ending very quickly, but I just want to point out that we also have the mass-produced molds used and employed and also the ability to move water, which is a really important innovation of ceramics and ceramic technology. And a lot of the movement of water and movement of heat that was created in, in uh, the Roman civilization came about by influence of kiln technology. Um, being able to create kind of what's, what's kind of known as a bag wall or um, a, um, a use of walls that protect against direct heat. So here we have these, uh, and this also interlocking Roman pipes. So all of these um, employed in early heating systems and e early water movement systems are all indications that ceramic materials were right there at the cusp of innovation for human societies. And you can see this is a hypocaust floor, which this is, and there's a re reconstructive drawing here, which shows um, the movement of the warmth, warm um, air up through the ceramics uh, flooring. All right, I don't have time to go into porcelain because I've run out of time. But I, of course, many of us know about the awesomeness of porcelain. And I want to end with this sort of idea that porcelain brings us really to our, to, it sort of draws us up to our current contemporary society and what we do with porcelain. My dad is a ceramic uh, or is an engineer and he uses ceramics in automated um, dipping systems. And so I grew up with a whole house full of um, rubber glove molds. Um, but what I want to point out is that some of the um, tools that we use, such as the mass spectrometer, have ceramic tools contained within them or ceramic parts. And so it's coming full circle that we're using ceramics to innovate and we're using that technology to go back then and read ancient ceramics. So um, there are parts within the spectrometer that are made of alumina and that, um, that because of their um, because of ceramics highly conductive surface and because of use in a high temperature that we need to use ceramic materials for these things. So I just love the fact that it's sort of a full circle thing that porcelain and um, new, new ceramic technology takes us back to the ancient. And I'll just close on this note that, um, again, this question that was posed earlier, this idea of innovation. And one, I want us all to think about um, ancient time, ancient ceramics, and how they might um, propel us to, to deal with the changes and challenges of our, of our um, environment and of our civilization today. Thank you.